the venue is interesting for me. Uh, I'm used to speaking, you know, with PowerPoint stuff. The slide tells you what you're supposed to say. That kind of, so. I feel yeah, a little you naked. Have a beautiful background. Yeah, I feel a little naked, so I'm just going to envision that you all are naked. Well, well maybe I'm <coughs> going a different path. So I'm Bob Hamilton, so I'm with the Nature Conservancy in Oklahoma at our Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, the other end of the Flint Hills, or as we call it, the Osage. Uh, once you get below the border, names are important, you know, what people call things. So generally in Oklahoma, we don't call it the Flint Hills, it's the Osage. So it's kind of, kind of most of western, western half Osage County, a little bit northeast of uh, K County. Uh, but we've got, we think of it as the, the front end of, the, of this Flint Hills landscape. It starts down there. This is the tail end up here. So not the other way around. Uh, but anyway, what I'll, what I'll talk about is um, what we're trying to do in terms of our basic conservation program, kind of ecological restoration, what we're doing on the preserve. And then I'll kind of slide into what we're trying to do in terms of engaging in conservation issues in the broader neighborhood. Uh, trying to bring conservation to a, to a larger scale. A little bit of background about me. I'm a Kansas boy, so grew up in, Win in Wellington. Went to school at Southwestern College at Winfield. Uh, that's where I met my wife. My, my, uh, do we have a mound builder in there? Uh, he yeah. grew up in Winfield. Mine went to college yeah, yeah, Southwestern yeah. 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 My daughter just graduated from, from Southwestern here just oh. a month ago. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so, yeah, we've got some Kansas roots. Uh, my mom still lives in Wellington, and uh, then I went to Emporia State for, for graduate school. So Tom Eddy was floating around here, if some of you know Dr. Eddy, uh, who was one of my major professors at, at Emporia State. So I was lucky when I graduated from Emporia. Uh, that spring I got a, a temporary job or a seasonal job as a kind of biotechnician intern on the Conservancy's Ordway Prairie Preserve, another Ordway Preserve, if you read the, the, the stone marker here. Catherine Ordway had a huge impact on prairie conservation, especially in the tall grass region of the Great Plains. Uh, bless her heart. Put in, our fundraising people could maybe throw some numbers at you, like $40 million or so into land protection. You know, back in the day when 40 million bucks would buy you something, uh, now that's maybe you know, what, one ranch. Um, but had a big influence. So I, that summer when I was in South Dakota, a permanent job opened up on a new preserve we had in North Dakota, the Cross Ranch Preserve, uh, about 40 miles north of Bismarck. <laughs> I think the Lord has a big sense of humor because back when I was in high school, and we, <laughs> my buddies and myself, when we talked about what do you want to do you know, on a Friday night, we'd throw a bunch of beer in the back of the truck and say, let's go to Bismarck. It was like, let's go to the end of the world. So somebody was listening. So anyway, I ended up working six years north of Bismarck and uh, then when we started up uh, we started up our program the Nature Conservancy started a state program in Oklahoma in 1986 and so in 1988 it had gotten to the point where we needed uh, some science and stewardship uh, involvement so I came to Oklahoma for that and uh, right away we got into the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve project but but first maybe a little background about the prairie in general and I'm probably speaking to the choir here. You guys probably already know all this stuff. But the prairie, and I'm talking about the, especially the, the eastern edge of the Great Plains, uh, the tall grass region, which historically was about 140 million acres, is our most highly impacted, our most highly converted percentage-wise, uh, most highly converted landscape of our, of our original ecosystem types in North America. Estimates are right now that only maybe about 4% of the original tall grass prairie remains. Just vast tracts of it, of course, are upside down now. So what is now the breadbasket of North America, kind of that eastern edge of the Great Plains, all those corn fields and, and uh, soybean fields in Iowa and eastern Kansas, eastern Nebraska, that used to be tall grass prairie, but it's, it's uh, upside down now and, and in till agriculture. So tall grass is our most highly impacted landscape. And as you all know, again, I'm sure you guys know this stuff, uh, the last big, really intact, relatively intact landscape example of tall grass prairie left on the continent is right here in this Flint Hills, Osage Hills landscape. 
four to five million acres, depending on how you, you uh, look at some of the imagery. Uh, but the last big chunk, Iowa, for instance, in pre-settlement times, if you look at some of those original uh, vegetation type maps, uh, you know, when Columbus bumped into this part of the world, Iowa was like 98% tall grass prairie. I don't know if there's anybody from Iowa in here. Uh, okay. <laughs> He's the media guy. Yeah. <laughs> He's used to taking bullets. Uh, well, I, I spoke early on when we got into the, our project in Oklahoma. Uh, I spoke at the North American Prairie Conference, which that year was in Iowa. This was 20-some years ago. In Iowa, again, you have originally like 98% tall grass prairie. They get very excited about 40-acre remnant prairies. There just ain't much left in that part of the world. The two speakers in front of me talked about they worked for the state DNR, the Department of Natural Resources in Iowa. Their presentations were about roadside prairie management. They spend state money, state wildlife management money, managing what's left between the edge of the road and the fence before it turns to soybeans. So they're actually managing the ditches because that's all that's left of their prairie. So then I get up there and I start showing slides. Oh, you can imagine how beautiful it's like, you know, of this Osage Flint Hills country. I felt a little, you know, like I was stomping on them a little bit there, but hey, that, you know, we all have our realities. So we are blessed with still having this relatively intact landscape right here in this part of the world, which, which is a huge leap forward. You know, in that part of the country, you get up in that Midwest region, there's a lot of conservation effort put in by the Nature Conservancy and other conservation groups and state agencies in prairie reconstruction, taking a cornfield back to prairie. Very expensive, very involved. To try to get the species composition back into that prairie, whew, that's a whole lot of work. Uh, we have cataloged, I think, a little over 760 species uh, on our little piece of property in Oklahoma very high quality, what's considered to be very high quality, very expensive prairie reconstructions uh, might get up to about 200 species. And so it's, it's just very difficult to get everything back in there. And there's long-term data showing that it probably takes centuries to restore that original soil carbon. You know, once you till that prairie, that, a lot of that carbon, a lot of the organic matter in the soil volatilizes and is really lost in terms of how we think of time. So anyway, uh, we've got this one big chunk of prairie uh, left here. Um, the way we go about trying to manage properties, again, the Nature Conservancy is, is all about uh, trying to manage and protect biological diversity. You can argue that really the only, the best, probably the only way to really maintain the complete array of native plants and animals is to have ecosystems at least approximate how they used to function in, in pre-settlement times. Uh, Different species require different habitat types. Uh, our grassland birds are a great example. The greater prairie chicken is a great example. They need different patch types, different amounts of fuel, different amounts of vegetation out there on the landscape. Different species require different things. First thing you learn, you know, in Wildlife Management 101, if you want deer, you manage the property this way. If you want quail, you manage that way. Species have their, their individual needs. We want our organizational mission is to bring everybody along for the ride. I think of this kind of building and maintaining a living ark. And how do you do that? You've got to have those ecosystems at least approximate how they used to function. Those are the conditions, those are the habitat conditions that those species need. So in the Great Plains, the big three in terms of kind of the primary forces of nature that really push this landscape around, really develop this landscape, were climate, Climate's the overriding influence, of course, uh, but that's an Al Gore thing, so I don't, as a land manager, I don't spend too much time thinking about climate. Uh, most people are just belly aching about the climate, you know, uh, we, but short-term stuff. As a land manager, for me, it's all about grazing and fire. I'm a fuels manager. I'm a combustion manager, really. So my job is really figuring out the fuel that's produced out there in the landscape, how are we going to combust that fuel? Are we going to burn it with animals? Run it through a rumen? Slow combustion? Or are we going to burn it quickly with fire? I'm, I'm, I'm a combustion manager. I should put that on my car. That'd be good. Uh, kind of a wonky sort of thing.
but grazing and fire are the two big forces that we think about at the, at the management level. And increasingly what we're seeing in the conservation biology circles, in range management circles, grassland ecology circles, is this growing appreciation and awareness that grazing and fire have this historic linkage, this incredible linkage between them. It's a global phenomenon. This fire grazing interaction has been shown to, to influence kangaroos in, in Australia. Of course, those, all those large grazing animals in, in Africa, even hippos, respond to fire. You don't think of hippos as being a, a, a real grazing animal that way. Uh, for sure in the Great Plains. The essential idea is burn it and they will come. It's all about forage quality, that lush green regrowth that comes up after a fire. Every bite's a good bite. For a grazing animal, it's all about what you're trying to do. If you're, if you're making a living off your rumen, what you're trying to do is maximize your efficiency. So it's all about forage quality and quantity. Where can you get the best quality and the best quantity on a burn patch? Every bite's a good bite. You don't have to dig through all that dead stuff. So it's all about forage quality. We think now the idea of migration has been pretty well poo-hooed in terms of bison over the last few decades. Some people still talk about it, especially in the romantic kind of literature and stuff. But I think it's pretty been pretty well poo-hooed. Now it's thought that really what was going on in the Great Plains was probably just a real helter-skelter, uh, gobbledygook, messy landscape. Your large herbivores that we think of historically being here, uh, bison, elk, antelope, and deer, um, they were probably really being driven by <laughs> forage quality. So again, this fire grazing interaction. Fire primarily being put on the landscape by native peoples. <coughs> Another growing appreciation is that what we have inherited is a human-derived landscape. This, especially in the tall grass region, as you get into these, uh, the more human end, the more moist end of the, of the Great Plains, where we have this ongoing and constant tension between woody species and non-woody species. The trees are constantly wanting to invade the prairie. If you had to generalize around the globe, the trees are winning. Altered fire regimes are allowing woody species to come on. Elevated carbon levels in the atmosphere are thought to be uh, favoring uh, that photosynthetic pathway uh, as compared to the pathway that grasses use. And so really, it's, it's, uh, it's this tension between uh, if, if a landscape wants to be a prairie or if it wants to be a, a woodland. So really, what we've inherited here is, is a human-derived landscape. Native peoples came, if you jump back 18,000 years ago or so, I get the, the years slip by, so I can't remember that. Uh, back when I was just a little guy. Um, at the peak of the last glaciation, we would have been standing in a boreal situation right here, a spruce fir, jack pine forest. This would have been much like northern Canada is now. Uh, you know, a mile or two of ice uh, really influences your climate. As the, as the glaciers retreated, that's when native peoples made it to this continent, somewhere in that 10 to 15,000 years ago. Uh, You've got a brand new landscape. What they brought with them was the power of fire. Native peoples used fire for all different reasons, and they used it liberally. And so, again, what is thought is their use of fire over those thousands of years is what really developed this as a, as a grassland landscape. What we see now is that you remove fire from the equation and suppress it. The systems change. Nature does not stand still. We just cause it to go in a different direction. What we're seeing in terms of uh, our challenges with eastern red cedar in the Great Plains is because of altered fire regime. We've suppressed fires or the fires that are happening don't have the intensity needed to control those species. Eastern red cedar is a native plant, but it's thought that in pre-settlement times it was restricted to those very rough kind of canyon type situations that were naturally protected from fire. Now that we've interrupted that fire regime, those cedars are coming out, they're crawling out into the open prairie and, uh, and really changing those environments. So even a native species can, can be a challenge that way. So again, if you could somehow go back, prevent native peoples from coming to this continent, if you could have walled them off 15,000 years ago, 
jump ahead to right now, we're the first humans to ever set foot on this continent. Without that Native American use of fire over that period of time, we would not be sitting in Kanza Prairie. This would be some sort of Kanza woodland. You know, this would be, be a whole different system. So it's, it's a human created, human maintained, and anthropogenic landscape is what we've inherited. Another little interesting twist is that our modern bison, the bison that you see out here, uh, you know, bison bison, is a fairly new species. It only shows up in the paleo record five to six thousand years ago. There were several generations, you know, of ancient forms of bison. Bison latifrons being the one people really like to look at, you know, that it was about 50% bigger than our current animal. Nine foot, or about a three meter wingspan on the horns, you know. Whew! <laughs> Jump on one of those babies. But our recent, our new bison, again, five to six thousand years ago, so some authors in scientific circles are trying to make the case that really what we have is a human developed grazer. Here this species evolved under this management uh, by native peoples of fire happening out there on the landscape, animals moving around, uh, their hunting pressure, and so they, they, they really developed our modern bison species. So, so it's kind of, that's a little background to, to think about in terms of how we think the original system worked. The other thing that's so important, if you, if you get into conservation biology stuff, um, again, this growing awareness that this, this patchiness in, in habitats is so important, or heterogeneity is, is the, the scientific term that's, term that's applied, hetero being different. And so this idea that all ecosystems have an inherent patchiness or inherent heterogeneity. Whether you're talking about a, a riparian system, how a river meanders, deposits, scours, whether you're talking in a, uh, a seaside, you know, shoreline system, whether you're talking grassland, whatever, nature is constantly in motion, and that that constant reorganization, that disturbance recovery, creates patchiness on the landscape. That's what species have evolved with, and that's what they require to maintain themselves. Our grassland birds, again, are, are a great example. Uh, in the springtime, when, um, when Hislow sparrows migrate back from Venezuela, uh, hopefully they migrate back from Venezuela, uh, when they come back, what they're looking for, their search image, is they need to have some standing dead grass to nest in. They won't nest on stuff that's fresh, freshly burned. So they've got to have some residual thatch out there. At the other end of the scale, you've got things like killdeers and upland sandpipers. What they're looking for is pool tables environments. And then you got species all in between, you know, uh, dick thistles are probably our most abundant grassland bird that we have. Uh, they're, they're kind of flexible, they'll go anywhere. Our greater prairie chickens need very different patch types during their life history period. You know, where the males do their booming, where they're displaying, is in those very short structured patches. You know, you can't show off for the babes in six foot grass. They gotta be able to see your moves. Right, John? Yeah. He'll, John will do the chicken dance here in a little bit. <laughs> So they've got to have that. Hens, of course, prefer to nest in their ground nesting birds, so they prefer to nest in a patch that can give them some concealment, some cover. And so they'll go for those patches that have a lot of residual grass in them. Typically, I mean, what research has shown on us is if the hens are nesting in patches where the grass is real thick, as soon as those chicks hatch, the hen tries to take them out. We don't quite know what chickens are thinking, but. Uh, the speculation is that that thatch can get so thick that those little puffball chicks just can't maneuver through that. They get exhausted. They have to be able to get good, easy access. That's my call. I gotta go. Uh, they have to be able to get access to bugs. Bugs are all about, you know, that's where they get their protein. That's where they get their moisture. So they gotta be able to access insects. So typically a hen will try to take those chicks right away to a patch that's been burned and is recovering. Ideally has some some broadleaf plants in there, some forbs that give them some protection from the elements and predators. Uh, the other thing about fire and grazers, that burn it and they will come does not just apply to, to ungulates. If you want to find the highest density of grasshoppers, go to a fresh burn patch. They're a grazer, right? So they're trying to maximize their efficiency. So burn it, everybody comes. Yeah. So, uh, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. 
So those are kind of the ecological principles we think about in terms of managing our property. Uh, we got into the Nature Conservancy, got into the tall grass, the other tall grass prairie preserve uh, back in the late 80s. We bought, I think of the tall grass uh, as our project was kind of old school uh, for TNC, at least originally how we got into it. We raised 15 million bucks to buy the old Barner Ranch, the historic Barner Ranch. Uh, 29, a little over 29,000 acres. Uh, we did it right, I think of it programmatically. When I was in the Dakotas, uh, Ms. Ordway, bless her heart, she gave a whole lot of money for land acquisition, but she didn't want any of her money to go for stewardship endowments or operational costs. Ooh, so when I was in the Dakotas, uh, we talked about the term, the internal term we used was our, our kind of our green endowments. So the way you operated those preserves, the way you raised money was you had to harvest your grass. Uh, it was your grass endowment. And so you had to either hay it, run cattle on it, bison, whatever. So very much like a ranching operation, you, you had to live off of what you could produce off of the, the property. There was no endowments that came with that. We did the tall grass project right in that we put money in the bank from the get-go. Uh, and so now the preserve is self-supported. So, about half our operating income comes from our, our stewardship endowment, kind of money in the bank, where we just spend the interest off of that. And then the rest of our operating funds come from sale of surplus bison and cattle income. But, but we're a standalone, self-supported project, which is, as a land manager, boy, that gives you a lot more flexibility. You can sleep a little better at night, you know. Well, we got into the Todd Grass project. We raised the money, bought the property. And what we've got going on, really, in terms of our, our conservation program, I guess kind of two things I might mention. One is, I think of it as our hardcore, let's see how far we can go in restoring that original tall grass prairie ecosystem. And so we have about 24,000 acres, kind of the central and southern part of the preserve, uh, where we've got this fire bison management project going on. The preserve is about 40,000 acres right now, <clears throat> so we've added to it through the years. The largest protected tall grass prairie protected in terms of land ownership uh, that we know of in the world. And what we're doing with, with our fire bison, we think, is the largest, most aggressive attempt to restore that original dynamic tall grass prairie ecosystem. So within that 24,000 acres, we, we got into the bison business. I guess I should back up a little bit. We got into the bison business in the fall of 1993. Uh, Kenneth Adams, Kenneth and Diane Adams from Bartlesville, Oklahoma, donated 300 bison to us. They gave us about 80% of their herd. Uh, but we started with 300 bison on the west side of our property on about 5,000 acres. We had a big, uh, you know, whenever you do these things, you got to, and you know, we're in constant fundraising motion, you know, <laughs> being a nonprofit group. Uh, and of course, you're trying to generate, you know, media coverage and things like that. So we had a big media event to release our animals. Uh, Norman Schwarzkopf was there. That was at the time he was on our national board of governors. It was right after the first Iraq war, so he was a high-profile guy. It was very interesting, the media that was there, we had British broadcasting there, we had Australian TV, we had a lot of international coverage, and then of course, uh, the American coverage. It was an interesting contrast though, because the international press, they didn't give a hoot about the general. You know, he'd been in their face for several years with all, all the war stuff. Uh, they were there because of the bison release. The soft, warm, fuzzy, you know, putting nature back together story. The Oklahoma press and, and kind of the the regional U.S. press that they were there because the general was there. Bison, they were just big brown cows. You know, what's the big hoot? So it was kind of it was interesting how to you know play those two different audiences. But but anyway, we had a nice event. Released the bison over the next 15 years. We would enlarge their their unit. As, as the uh, uh, as the herd grew, and so I think in 2008 was when we reached our target. So we have about 24,000 acres. We overwinter about 2,000 bison on that. Uh, typically have about six to 700 calves in the summer. So we should have about 26, 2,700 bison sloshing around within that 24,000 acres right now. They're free to go where they want to go within that boundary. You know, please don't leave. Uh, and we have very few containment problems. We actually have more problems with cattle getting in than bison getting out. But uh, within that landscape, again, we're trying to approximate that original system. 
So we're burning in spring, summer, and fall. Uh, that, we know from historical accounts the prairie was burning all the time, not just in the, in the spring. Uh, so we burn uh, in all different seasons. We burn roughly about a third of that unit every year, about a three-year fire return. But it's a random selection system. I don't know where we're going to burn this summer. We go through a, a, a system to pick points on the landscape. The idea is to get back to this, again, this fire grazing interaction. Bison grazing influences where fire is going to occur. It's easy to see you know, fire, regrowth. It's easy to see how fire can influence where the grazers are going to be because that lush regrowth. But at the same time, the grazers are influencing the probability of when that particular acre is going to burn again. If they keep the grass mowed down, they're removing the fuel. And so the likelihood of that patch burning in the, in the near future is reduced. And so the grazers influence where the fire is going to occur. So a true interaction is this yin-yang thing, back and forth. So that's what we think we've got going. So it's a random selection system. The idea is this very messy landscape. And so what we've got going on is patches at any given time. You have to think of it like you're at 20,000 feet elevation, looking down, kind of a crazy quilt sort of thing going on. Fires happening all different seasons, moving around from year to year. The bison respond to that, so they move around. Again, it's kind of a fire-induced rotational system. What we see from that is that heterogeneity that, re that results from that, the very patchiness out there, all these different patch types, that appears to be supporting this full array of biological diversity that we want. We've had about 180 scientific publica publications come off the preserve so far, and it all seems to be saying, yeah, this is working pretty well. Check. We feel like that's getting along pretty well. But the short, I got like two minutes. So you so, you so, can have all the time you want. I'm just trying to be helpful. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. <laughs> we never thought, way back in the early planning stages, we never thought this whole fire bison thing, pretty wonky. Uh, we never thought it was going to be very exportable to the surrounding neighborhood. Most ranchers are not going to switch to bison. They're not going to be burning in all different seasons. Random selection. Oh my God! You know, I mean, it's a, it's a very involved process to do what God used to do for free. You know, to play God on the prairie. Uh, so what what's really going on around us, of course, is domestic livestock production. One of the concerns uh, over the last few decades is the growing popularity of the double early stock. Intensive early stocking system. Uh, starting in about the late 70s, early 80s, what's become so popular is burning the prairie on an annual basis, uh, burning the entire pasture, you double stock, you put twice the number of steers out there, but just for the first half of the summer. So you're trying to harvest your forage with your animals when it's at its highest quality, almost like a haying operation. The cattle all leave in our area, they all leave about mid July. The prairies allow them to regrow through the rest of the growing season, which recharges the, you know, the status of those plants. They can, they can rebuild their reserves. Plus, you, you get a nice regrowth. Typically, we'll get a little bit of rain, you know, in August and September. We'll get some nice regrowth after those cattle leave. That's your fuel bed for next spring's fire. The concern is that's become so popular. And so now, you know, millions of acres burn in, in the Flint Hills in, in a typical spring and it's homogenizing the landscape. So if you're looking at it from a wildlife habitat, wildlife diversity perspective, it's being managed, vast tracts are being managed repeatedly year after year to, to maintain this uniformity. Uniformity is not how nature works again. Nature is all about this patchiness, this diversity, this heterogeneity. So we've, we've hooked up with, I shouldn't use that term, I don't know. <laughs> so we've joined hands. <laughs> With, with Oklahoma State University, uh, if you're trying to influence agriculture, you know, how do you do that? Uh, again, the Nature Conservancy, we try to be fairly uh, objective, and uh, we thought, well, you know, who do we want to go to? Who, who is agriculture going to listen to? The Nature Boys, as we're called locally, or are they going to listen to Oklahoma State University Extension? That's the, the official developer and exporter of agricultural information. So we have a really good partnership going on with Oklahoma State University. And in 2001, we started uh, 
uh, work on patch burn grazing experiments, applied research with OSU, looking at patch burn grazing with cattle. Kind of a simpler idea of what we're doing in the bison unit, but, but rather than burning a complete pasture, you just burn a portion of it. Think of it as multiple year rotation. Still stock it the same, like it's all been burned, knowing that the cattle are going to concentrate on that fresh burn unit, just like the bison did. That seems to be working real well, and we're now in our third generation here just this spring. We started our third set of treatments on that. We've got 11,000 acres that we're dedicating to this, seven different pastures, looking at different treatment types. But this new round of experiments, what we're going to focus on is, uh, we think we've got the heterogeneity thing figured out. We're, we're, we're seeing a lot of those same benefits as what we can do with fire and bison, we can do with cattle on fire. Are you doing this on your land? On our land, yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, specifically, what we're trying to focus on a little more with this go around is Cerecia lespedeza. Anybody familiar with the demon weed, as I think of it, the devil's weed? <laughs> Southeast Asian plant, herbaceous plant, non-woody plant. The, the number one non-woody invasive plant problem for the whole southern tall grass prairie region, really from Iowa, Nebraska, South. Uh, Tremendous problem. What makes it so, it has several things that make it successful, but primarily it's the tannins that it builds up. So early in the growing season, when it first emerges, cattle will take it. But once it gets any kind of growth on it, it starts building up tannins in the, in the tissues. I'm not a biochemist, but what I understand though is the tannin molecule binds with the protein molecule. It changes the chemistry in the rumen. It upsets the nitrogen cycle in the rumen and basically gives the animal a bellyache and makes that protein undigestible. So the cow learns fairly quickly, don't eat that plant. So it's chemically protected. What OSU has found is in some of their work with patch burn grazing is that as long as you, if you can keep Ceresia in that lush regrowth phase, then it is palatable. It's when it gets some, some growth to it. So, Patch burn grazing appears to be uh, one way to maybe try to manage that to keep it in that regrowth phase. Again, you're concentrating, you stock the pasture the same, but you're getting three times the stocking pressure if you're in a three year fire return. If you just burn a third of the pasture, you're putting three times the stocking rate on that patch, at least for that treatment period. So you're able to keep it in that regrowth phase, kind of a focal grazing effect. So that, that appears to be somewhat promising. So, yeah. Yeah. Please. If I have a square foot of ground and I'm looking at the results after the fire test, and you know, Depends on what you mean by better. Yeah, it's a relative. Yeah. Fire is very different than grazing, especially when it comes to the impact on woody species. Yeah. Uh, so you're not going to get a cow to eat a cedar tree. Okay. Fire will eat it. <laughs> uh, so, yes. Yeah, there are some similarities in mowing. You can't approximate grazing, but it's still not quite the same. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not answering your question, I know. But, no, that's all right. Yeah. Uh, and those two, two very different influences, but again, we try to think of them as, as conjoined. Right. So we're seeing some, some promising uh, results from the patch burn grazing stuff. The other thing we're trying to do in our neighborhood, and, and the patch burn grazing deal is now Great Plains thing. We have a patch burn working group. Uh, that we have annual meetings that move around this year. If anybody's interested in coming, Pratt, Kansas is going to host a uh, meeting this summer. Typically, it's a several day process. You know, some talks, kind of updates about research people are doing around. Then we do a lot of infield, you know, looking at some ranch examples. Uh, last year was in Nebraska, the year before was in South Dakota. Uh, but it's catching on. It's, you know, if you're trying to manage grasslands to kind of, kind of sort of approximate those original disturbance features, this is one way, one tool, uh, you can try to do that with domestic livestock also. What's the incentive to the livestock producer to, to, to adopt that? Yeah, what we've seen, the other thing we're collecting on our experiments, uh, again, we're in our third generation of, of 
uh, kind of scientific questions, but what we've seen so far is no statistical difference in cattle gains. So we get the same cattle gains on an annual burn double stock pasture as we can get with these different patch burn grazing uh, treatments. So, so Mr. Rancher, if you're interested in managing your, your grassland to maybe support a little bit more biological <laughs> diversity rather than annual burning, patch burn grazing is one tool you might think about. We don't think, from, from the research we've seen on our site and Oklahoma State University has seen on their uh, range experiment station, uh, is no impact on your pocketbook. Is, is, there, is there a positive impact on the uh, chicken populations? Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So you're managing for heterogeneity, okay. or, or the result of patch burn grazing is you get these different patch types all within one pasture, rather than having the whole unit be homogenized and, and uniformly managed. So, uh, are landowners collaborating then across fence lines to patch burn in a bigger system? Or? Good question. Let's get that. Yeah. 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 Another, another thing that we've got going in our neighborhood is working with our private landowner neighbors to try to restore greater prairie chicken. And the greater prairie chicken population has been on this steady, troublesome decline. Some people point to the fact that, well, chickens started sliding about the time the double early stocking system started becoming so popular. You know, our, our prairie chickens are grassland nesting birds. I mean, they're a ground nesting bird. So if you've just burned off a half a million acre block, uh, where am I going to nest? You know? They will nest in burn patches. Uh, they'll try to nest for that little feature that did not burn a little clump, a little blue stem or something. But their their nest success is way down. The predators find them much easier. You know, that, that very short. And they're about the size of a football. So you know, if you throw a football out here. Mr. Coyote's going to see you. Uh, so the other thing we've got going is working with our neighbors. We've got about uh, private landowners, about 100,000 acres uh, adjacent to us, where our strategy has been in approaching them. What they've gone to over the last several decades is this complete combustion. So you know, their standard practice was burn every acre every year. That's cool looking. Boy, it looks like Ireland when it all greens up, you know. And they are keeping the woody species out. You know, that's great, but wow, you're homogenizing a great big chunk of landscape. Uh, the way we approached them was, well, how about if we work together to manage fire a little more creatively? For a, for a landowner, we've got a, a landowner, a neighbor of ours has 50,000 acres. Uh, it's much, at that scale, it's much easier to burn the whole darn thing. You know, you just use the major roads, whoosh, uh, do some big co-op burns with the neighbors even, you get even bigger units. Uh, to ask them to try to do something a little different, leave a thousand acres here, a thousand acres there, unburned, it's more troublesome for them, more liability, more work, you know, at that scale that they're managing. So the way we've tried to overcome that is by throwing in together. We join crews and equipment. We help them leave some tracks unburned. And so this spring, that big neighbor next to us left about 40,000 acres or 40% of his ranch unburned specifically for prairie chickens. We've got, again, about 100,000 acres of private lands next to us that are managing deliberately for chickens. People like chickens. We talk about the chicken love. You know, you gotta embrace the chicken love. So, uh, and if you're managing for chickens, again, prairie chickens require these different patch types. And so if you're managing for prairie chickens and managing your grass that way, for diversity, you're also providing the landscape diversity, the heterogeneity that all these other species need. So we think of prairie chickens as a great kind of umbrella type conservation species. We can focus on chickens, and everybody else will come along for the ride. So, so we're having some, some pretty good luck with chickens. So uh, we would ultimately like we've got a chicken team, kind of a little ad hoc chicken team we call it, that gets together typically once a year. That's kind of all the agency folks you can think of, and the university researchers. We try to interact with those landowners, provide them uh, the best science, kind of, you know, currently what's known. And ultimately what we'd like to do is get back to where we once again have a hunting season in Oklahoma. Uh, we have not had a hunting season on greater prairie chickens since 1996. I think the population got so low. So our private landowners, they're feeling the chicken love, but what would be probably even more motivating for them is if we could get the population back up where we had huntable species, then they might be able to make a little extra income on the side with some bee hunting and things like that. So uh, 
we're kind of working in that direction. So, yes. I recently ran on a project that's in Iowa. It's called a strip program. Are you familiar with that? Strip? Yeah. Uh, X-ray. Yeah. <laughs> You can demonstrate for what it. they do is they go into a field, <laughs> let's say a section of land, and they plant native prairie in there, about 10% of the land. Hmm. And it reduces nitrogen loss, phosphate loss, and, and erosion. But it's a marvelous thing for uh, bird habitat and also a butterfly. I, I'm from yeah. Lawrence, and we've got a Chapter there that's a, a butter, uh, monarch butterfly guy. Yeah. And that would be provide habitat for the monarch. Yeah. There's diversity out there in the landscape. Is anything in Oklahoma like that? I, I'm not aware of that. Is, is that a USDA program or a state? I think it's, I don't know if it's anybody's program right now. It started in Iowa. You can look it up online. Yeah. Um, they took some of their conservation land kind of like you're doing to do experiments. Not to pick on Iowans again, but I mean the great thing we have here, conservation wise, we we leapfrog right over that whole prairie reconstruction step. We still have the prairie. <clears throat> so conservation, in terms of our conservation actions, we have the luxury of, of being able to just jump straight ahead and start thinking and acting on process restoration. How do we want to manage grazing and fire? <coughs> Excuse me, to benefit conservation. It's still prairie. All we got to do is go out there and tweak it. Uh, we don't have to do the hard. Well, that's hard work to take a cornfield back to prairie. Oh my God. You know, that's, well, that's tough uh, stuff. What is the estimate for it? Really good. 50 or 100 years? <coughs> yeah, centuries. Right. And unfortunately, there's been a little movement. <clears throat> you know, there was a growing interest in the whole carbon market uh, back maybe a decade ago or so. Um, kind of sequestering carbon. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those efforts so far have been focused on, you have to be able to show, in, in terms of your measurement, you have to be able to measure soil carbon, you have to be able to show a significant uh, advantage by whatever action you're doing. The only way you can really show that is by taking, at least so far, by taking a plowed field where the soil carbon has been lost, essentially. 80% of it's been lost uh, to till agriculture. Planting it back to a permanent vegetative cover, and after a few years you can see a significant jump in soil carbon. Uh, so those programs have favored land that's already been plowed, American ingenuity being what it is, uh, that led to people gaming the system, plowing native prairie, planting it for corn, for ethanol for a few years, oh, then signing up to plant it back to prairie to get the payments for sequestering carbon or the CRP. Jeez, you know, um, that's kind of a whole other issue, I guess, but yeah unintended consequences, you know. So, but if you can keep it in prairie, wow, you're, they're just so far ahead. And who knows, the great plowing of the American prairies that occurred 150, 200 years ago, how much all that organic soil carbon that was released to the atmosphere, I've, I've never seen it in, in any scientific publication, but that would be interesting. Surely somebody's done a back-of-the-envelope calculation. How much of our atm atmospheric carbon came from those past land management actions? Releasing all that. What we have, especially in the in these eastern prairies in this tall grass region, what, what we're sitting on is a bank of carbon. And this carbon that's been stored underground for thousands of years, as long as you keep it in an anaerobic situation where oxygen cannot get to it, it is stored. It's locked in the bank. You plow it, poof, very quickly, within weeks, that soil carbon starts volatilizing, and it's gone. It goes to the atmosphere. And to get it back, you know, the way the prairie builds carbon is by primarily by root replacement. 
it's, it's not really from the, the dead grass on top being composted down in there. It, it pretty well breaks down and, and is gone. The way the prairie builds organic matter in the soil is the constant pruning of the roots. You know, on general, these warm season grasses will replace about a third of their root mass every year. They're constant. It's like a tree underground. They're constantly replacing their roots. And all those dead roots then, that's, what, that's the organic matter that, that builds those good black soils <clears throat> that became the cornfields of Iowa. <laughs> Former prairie. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know where all that's going. But anyway, come on down to Oklahoma sometime. We have this weather all summer. <coughs> come down in July. It'll be just like this. <laughs> come on down and uh, wallow around with our animals a little bit. Uh, the preserve is open year round every day self-guided hiking trail system, you, you drive through the bison unit. I think it's the only, the Conservancy has 12 bison herds that we own and manage. I think it's the only one where it's an open range situation. Well, I take that back to Mendo and Colorado also. But you drive through, there's about 15, maybe a little bit more than that, miles of public county road that are in the bison unit. So if, if your timing is right, you, you can be, you're like a pebble in the stream stop your car, they will flow around your vehicle, lick your mirrors and rub on your, <laughs> your truck, you know. How many did you say you have again? Uh, this time of year should be about 2,600, oh, 2,700, okay. counting the calves. Okay. Pretty cool, you get into a group of a thousand or so. The bulls are roaring already. It's it's like the American Serengeti. When we get it, the real breeding season is in July, August. But they're already talking, the bulls are talking already. So there's some breeding activity going on. But they're they're advertising their hierarchy all the time. And it's this deep rumbling. It sounds like and they'll roar at each other. And at night you just swear there's lions out there. I mean it's that and it, and it just carries along. It's well, it makes your hair stand up. Here. You think you're not maybe on the top of the food chain, but no, it's just it's just your neighborhood friendly bison that's advertising he's looking for love. Yeah. 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 And he's a big man. Yeah. 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 So come on down. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good question. Hey, there you go, there you go. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah.